my dear brothers and sisters, we have all made vows to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-A'raf, verse 172, and remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extracted from the children of Adam their loins from their backs and made them testify, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And they said, Qalu bala shahidna. Indeed, we have testified. So that on the day of judgment, we will not be able to say that we were heedless of this affair. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator and sustainer. And that was one of the first things that came to my mind. The vow, the, vow, the covenant that we made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Greater than any vow that a husband makes to a wife or a wife to a husband or a mother to a child or any other relationship. Yet you see when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shaitan has won this battle in distancing us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I want to dedicate this talk to loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. I want to dedicate this talk to getting to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again in hopes that we can fulfill our vow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no matter what happens in our lives, no matter how bad that amnesia gets, no matter how bad the accident, we will always know who Allah is and why we love Him. Let's start off by how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us of this in the Qur'an. The famous verse that all of us know here, we've heard it many, many times, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I did not create the mankind in jinn except for my worship. The greatest mufassir of the Qur'an, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he said about this verse, that to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that the greatest form of worship that we can do is to get to know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Because once you truly know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, you cannot help but to worship Allah and to love Allah and to venerate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Hashr, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us and do not become of those people who forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them forget themselves indeed these people are the transgressors now there's two points in this verse over here the first point is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says do not be of those people who forgot Allah now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just doesn't give you a problem he gives you a solution as well so the solution to having forgotten Allah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to tell you who he is two verses later. When he goes on to tell us in these three beautiful verses who Allah is. Which starts off with, Subhanallah هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم. In these three verses, Allah subhanahu wa taala reminds us of who He is. So the people who forget Allah get to know Allah subhanahu wa taala again through His names and attributes. But Allah subhanahu wa taala teaches us a second lesson, and this is the logical proof in terms of why we need to know Allah subhanahu wa taala. We're constantly told that this journey of life is about self-discovery, discovering who we are, discovering ourselves. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this verse that in order to truly discover who you are, in order to truly discover your potential, you need to discover who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is first. Because you will become a manifestation of the things that you ask Allah for. A manifestation of the things that you obey Allah with. A manifestation of those things that you plea Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. So in order to truly discover who you are, you need to discover who your creator is. Because if your creator is filled with generosity, he will create generosity in you. If your creator is loving, he will create love in you. If your creator is pardoning, then he will instill pardoning inside of you as well. So to discover who you are and who you should be, you need to realize and learn who your creator is. So this in summary is why we need to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Firstly, the commandment of Allah. Secondly, it's about discovering who we are. It's about discovering where we stand in the world. It's about discovering, are we really the moral and ethical people that we claim to be? 
Because all good comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So now let us take a look at who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually is. The most glorious name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah. And this is the primary name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the name Allah comes from Al-Ilah, the worshipped, Al-Ma'bud. So Allah is a signification of our worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will see that the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this beautiful name to constantly be used in the Quran, to constantly be used to call upon Him, is to remind us of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To remind us of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of worship, one of servitude. We were created to remember Allah, to venerate Allah, to love Allah, to make sajda to Allah, to make ruku'a to Allah. This is our relationship with Him. And this is why throughout the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the term Allah to remind you that the one that created you, the one that sustains you, the one that you call upon is the only one that is worthy of your worship. Now one of the unique things about the name of Allah, Jalla fi ula, that a lot of us do not know about, is that the name Allah is one of the greatest names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a name that if he was to be called by it, he responds. If he is to be asked by it, he gives. And over the 40 opinions that exist, two of them are the strongest. They are Al-Hay and Al-Qayyum being the first opinion and Allah being the second opinion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but it seems that Allah is the stronger opinion. Because if you look at the du'as that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, that mentioned the greatest names of Allah, all three of them mention Allah, but not all three of them mention Al-Hayy and Al-Qayyum. So when you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, call Him by this name, and you'll see the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala performs. This Lord that we talk about Allah, He is Allah because He possesses every beautiful name and every beautiful attribute. And He is worthy of our worship because He possesses these names. So you see that it becomes circular in nature. That we can not only worship He who possesses all the beautiful names and attributes. And since we worship Him, then by necessity, every beautiful name and attribute must belong to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's look at another name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Wudud, the loving and the beloved. Bring it back to the movie. When I asked the man, you know, why was he crying? One of the things he mentioned was that I wish I had a love like this in my life. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, at that time, that no matter how much love you have in this life from your friends, from your spouses, from your parents, from everyone else in this world, you will always have a void in your heart that can only be fulfilled by the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he goes on to mention. That indeed in the heart is a void that can only be fulfilled with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a lot of us don't realize this. A lot of mankind does not realize it. So that void that they find in their heart, they try to fulfill it with the desires of this world. Whether it be through wealth, whether it be through you know, women, whether it be through everything else. They try to fulfill it through desires. But they notice that they become more empty and more empty as these desires are fulfilled. They'll see that they'll try to fulfill it maybe with alcohol, with drugs. But where does that lead them? It leads them along the same path. They'll try to fulfill it with every each and every single thing, but it won't be fulfilled. Because that portion of your heart was created to be loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he gives a beautiful example. He says the love of Allah in the heart of the believer is like a tree. The love of the believer for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a tree. Its roots are the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Its trunk is humility for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Its leaves is modesty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fruit that, it's bear, that it bears is obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you'll see that our whole relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it revolves around love. And this is why Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he gives his other famous example and parable. That our journey of worship towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like that of a bird whose head is love and its two wings are fear and hope. 
Now what is a bird without a head? It is not going to survive, it's not going to be able to fly. Similarly, our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it does not begin with love, then our journey will not progress. And that is why I began with Al-Wudud to remind us of this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us and He wants us to love Him as well. And this is one of the unique names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where not only is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the subject, but He is the object as well. So when we talk about Ar-Rahman, He is the one who shows mercy. He is not the one who has mercy shown to Him. When we talk about that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Ghaffar and Al-Ghafoor, He is the forgiver, but He is not the one who is forgiven. But when it comes to Al-Wudud, not only subhanahu wa ta'ala is He the loving, but He is the beloved as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that there's not a tree except that it glorifies Allah. Not a bird except that it glorifies Allah. Not any one of Allah's creations except that it is glorifying the Him, except that we do not understand their glorification. Listen to the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa where he says, the skies shake. The skies shake and creak and they have the right to shake and creak. Because there's not a distance of four fingers except that an angel is making ruku'ah, an angel is making sajda, an angel is making king qiyam to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this will continue till the day of judgment. This is the love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for him. Now our question arises, where is our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Bidnillahi ta'ala, we'll learn that by the end of the discussion. We move on to a sitir that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who covers up. And this is a beautiful example for all of us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with our deficiencies, created us with our mistakes. But with these deficiencies, with these mistakes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers us up just like we use clothes to cover up our bodies. During the time of Musa alayhi salam, rain stopped to come down. It ceased to descend and a drought came about. So people came to Musa and they said, Ya Musa, you speak directly to your Lord. Will you not go to him and speak to him and ask him for rain to come down? So Musa, he goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he asks him, Oh Allah, time has gone by and rain has not come down. What is the reasoning behind this? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him that there is an individual in the community who has not sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 40 years. And up and until this person leaves, rain will not come down. So tell this person to leave and then rain will come down. So Musa alayhi salam goes back to his people and he tells his people, Oh people, there is an individual from amongst all of you that has been committing sins for the last 40 years and not once has he repented. Whoever he is, let him leave our community so that the rain can come down, so that we can be nursed once again. And then you can imagine in a gathering like this, no one moves, no one gets up. But then miraculously, the rain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts to descend. And people start to wonder, what happened? Musa just said that until someone leaves, the rain is not going to come down. But no one came down. But no one left. So Musa alayhi salam, he goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he asks him, Oh Allah, you said that the rain will not come down up and until someone leaves. But no one left and the rain started to come down. At that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him something so profound. He said, my slave made such a sincere repentance, I couldn't help but forgive him. I couldn't help but forgive him. So Musa alayhi salam, being the slave of Allah, he's curious, who is the slave of Allah that got forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Perhaps I can benefit from him as well. So he asks him, Oh Allah, who is this individual that you have just forgiven and pardoned? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to tell him, Oh Musa, I concealed his sin while he was a sinner and did not expose him. Do you think that I shall expose him now that he has repented? Allahu Akbar. Allah is a sitir, the one that covers up. My dear brothers and sisters, no matter what sin that you may have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers that sin. It is between you and Allah. And that is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us that all of his ummah will be forgiven except for those who expose their own sins. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, while knowing that sin that you committed, He covered it up for you. 
So who are you to go and expose that sin? So take advantage of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being a sitir, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not expose you and turn back to Allah and repent to Him. Sufyan ibn Ayyayna, one of the great imams of the Salaf, he said, be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create an odor for our sins. For if indeed there was an odor for our sins, none of us would be able to sit next to another. And it's the type of odor that you can't like mask with deodorant or like axe or anything else. <laughs> you know, that's a big blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us talk about Al-Mujib, the one who answers all supplications. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَإِذَا سَعَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ الدَّعْوَ تَدْعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ That if my slave asks about me, tell them that I am near. I answer the supplication of every supplicator. Let me share the story of a, a sister with you. She says, it was the first day of Ramadan and my father had a heart attack while he was in the masjid. So they take him to the hospital, I hurry to the hospital and I'm looking at my father. And I see this beautiful old man, the man that took care of me when I was young, the man that changed my diapers, the man that took me to school, the man that tried his best to grant me every single thing that I desire. And I realized what a terrible daughter I was to him at that day. So I made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I said, Oh Allah, please grant him life so that I can show him the same righteousness that he showed me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought him out of the heart attack and gave him life. For four, for, for four more months. In these four months, she did everything she possibly could from cooking for him, cleaning for him, driving him to his appointments, any wish or desire that he had, she would be the one fulfilling it. But at the end of the four months, she starts to realize that subhanAllah, life is really getting difficult for my father. He can't go to the bathroom on his own. He can't breathe on his own. And while it's great to have him around the house, it's unjust of me to want him to keep being alive, but be suffering at the same time. So she makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, oh Allah, please do not let him leave this world, except in a state of obedience to you. So the day of Jummah comes four months later, he goes out for Salatul Jummah, he comes home with his friends and his family, and it's as if he's perfectly fine, perfectly healthy, nothing is wrong at all. He spends the whole day together with his family and friends, they pray Salatul Isha, and the father excuses himself. He says, I'm feeling tired. So the youngest daughter, she takes him upstairs. And not even five minutes go by, but she starts shouting, everyone come upstairs, everyone come upstairs. So everyone goes upstairs. And you can imagine as if you're walking into that room and it is your own father that his spirit is leaving his body. His eyes are gazing up towards the skies and his spirit is leaving. And as that is happening, He's saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the infinitely good, the merciful, are two names derived from mercy. Mercy requires an object of mercy, and no one is an object of mercy unless he be in need. His mercy covers everything, everyone, whether they are a mu'min believer, whether they are a kafir, one who disbelieves, whether it's a jinn, whether it's a believing jinn, a non-believing jinn, whether it's uh, uh, birds in the sky, whether it's fish in the sea, whether it's the um, earth and the worms inside the earth, Allah's Rahmah and His mercy covers everything. Ar-Rahman and His name Ar-Rahim and His name Arhamur Rahimin and Khairul Rahimin and the Rahmah. And by deriving five different names from the same root, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing the concept of rahmah. And there is no question that the primary 
attribute of the entire Quran when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the attribute of Rahmah. There is no other noun or verb from which five names have been derived. And if you look at the quantity of times that Allah ascribes mercy to Himself in the Quran, there is no other attribute that comes close. Over 500 different adjectives and verbs and nouns all of which derive around Rahmah are ascribed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim are found in the Quran in a number of different places. In the case of the name Ar-Rahman, it is found 57 times in the Quran. In kullu man fis samawati wal ard illa ata ata rahmani abda. All in the heavens and the earth come to God, the beneficent, as a servant. And really these are two of the greatest names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the most oft repeated names in the Quran. And they are among the names that are repeated many, many, many times in the Quran. From this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa the most merciful Ar-Rahman has risen over the throne. كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ Your Lord has decreed for Himself that He shall be merciful. كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ And this ayah, it illustrates for us a very interesting point. Even Allah has laws. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obeys laws. But no one has the right to legislate upon Allah, except Allah. Allah has the right to legislate on Himself. And no other entity has the right to legislate upon Allah. And if Allah had wanted to, He could have legislated anything upon Himself. Even Allah has rules that He abides by. But what are these rules? Allah Azza wa Jal has told us a few of them. Of them, and the most important one, Inna rahmati taghlibu ghadabi. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that your Lord decreed, this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari Muslim, and it uh, affirms what the Quran is saying. Your Lord decreed upon Himself before creating the heavens and earth by 50,000 years. And it's 50,000 means in, in, beyond our comprehension. Before Allah created anything, he decreed upon himself a rule that he wrote in a book that is with him. Literally the hadith says, Kitaban in the nafsi. He has a book that is with Allah. So even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a code book, has a law. Every entity has laws, even Allah. But the difference is Allah legislates upon himself. And Allah has rules that he has promised his servants he will always abide by. And what is the number one rule that we learn in the Quran and in the Sunnah? Inna rahmati taghlibu ghadabi. My rahmah shall always overcome my anger. My mercy shall always triumph shall always win over my anger. Perfect mercy is pouring out benefication to those in need and directing it to them for their care and inclusive mercy is when it embraces deserving and undeserving alike. The mercy of God, great and glorious, is both perfect and inclusive. Tamama wa amama. Perfect in as much as it wants to fulfill the needs of those in need and does not meet them and inclusive in as much as it embraces both deserving and underdeserving, encompassing this world and the next, and includes bare necessities and needs and special gifts over and above them. So he is utterly and truly merciful. Both names come from the, the Arabic root Rahma, which means mercy. And both of them are what are called intensive forms of the present participle. The original form Rahim becomes Rahman and Rahim. Now, both of them, f fundamentally we're saying, means merciful, but there are some subtle differences between the two. Rahman is looked at as being a more intensive form than Rahim because the intensive forms are depending on the number of letters that, that constitute. 
constitute them, the more letters, the more intensive they're considered to be. And Rahman has more letters than Rahim. But in terms of the understanding with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the general explanation which is commonly given and most people are familiar with it is that Rahman is one who possesses complete mercy for the creatures of this world and for the believers in the next, covering both worlds, this world and the next. Whereas Rahim is more specific for the believers on the Day of Judgment. A greatness to his mercy that shows there is no end to this mercy. And Ar-Rahim, Allah's name Ar-Rahim, is when Allah has mercy specifically to the believers. So this is only to those who have turned to Him. This is only to those who believe in Him. These are only people who are close to Him. These are only people whom Allah has chosen. And they, if it's in this dunya, if it's in this world, then His Rahmah, His mercy will be with them specifically. Uh, uh, as, as well as those who don't believe in Him, that's fine, that's from Rahman. But Rahim is only for the Akhirah. So when in the next world, Allah Azza wa Jal, on the day of judgment, He will have mercy on the believers, it will be Him as being Rahim. The name Ar-Rahman, the name Ar-Rahman is a unique name. There is no other name like it in the Quran other than the name Allah itself. And the name Allah and the name Ar-Rahman have a unique status that no other name shares. And that is that both of these names are considered to be the primary name of Allah. Typically, the name Allah and the name Ar-Rahman, they occur by themselves. They don't have a second name attached to them. Rarely they do, but typically it's by themselves. And the name Ar-Rahman is linked directly with the name Allah. قُلْ اِدْعُوا اللَّهَ أَوْ اِدْعُوا الرَّحْمَانِ Allah says, call upon Allah or call upon Ar-Rahman. Whichever of these two that you choose, أَيَّمْ مَا تَدْعُوا Whichever of these two that you choose, فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى All of the other names belong to Him. So Allah and Ar-Rahman, Allah says, all the other names go back to them. And there's no other name that has been raised to that status other than these two, Allah and Ar-Rahman. In the case of Ar-Rahman, this is a description of Allah's essence, of Him, in character himself. Ar-Rahman is the most merciful and that Ar-Rahim is the bestower of mercy. Meaning that Ar-Rahman refers to the mercy that Allah has and Ar-Rahim refers to the fact that he gives out that mercy. Now he has given out one hundredth of that mercy in this dunya and ninety-nine out of a hundred he has kept to give to the believers in the Akhirah. But both the dunya and the Akhirah, he is giving this mercy to people and withholding it from people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions his name Ar-Rahman in 57 occasions of the Quran. 57 occasions. Around 50 of them are standalone. They have no other name. And as I said, there's no other name that is standalone other than the name Allah. So for example, Ar-Rahman, Allama al-Qur'an, Khalaq al-Insan. This is a standalone name, Ar-Rahman. And Allah begins ayat with Allah, and He begins ayat with Ar-Rahman. And there's no other name that a, that a chapter or a surah begins with. And typically in verses of majesty, in verses of glory, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the name Ar-Rahman. For example, when Allah mentions His most magnificent creation, the biggest creation of Allah, the most magnificent creation, and that is, by the way, the throne of Allah. The largest creation of Allah is Allah's throne, Allah's arsh. Whenever Allah mentions His arsh, He always mentions the name Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahmanu ala al-arsh istawa. Ar-Rahmanu ala al-arsh istawa. Seven different times in the Quran this phrase occurs. Seven exact same phrase. Never does Allah say Allah ala al-arsh istawa. 
He always says Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. And Ibn Al-Qayyim mentions the wisdom behind this. He says, when the Arsh or the throne of Allah is the largest creation, and we know this from many ahadith, by the way, uh, that the Prophet mentioned that uh, it is the heaviest of the creation and it is the largest of the creation. So when the Arsh is the largest of the creation, Ibn Al-Qayyim says, Allah wanted to mention that attribute of creation, and that is the attribute of Rahmah. That Allah's Rahmah envelopes even the largest creation. Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. And there is no name of Allah that occurs upon the same structure. Now this goes a little bit advanced. I don't want to confuse you with morphology or sarf. But the Arabic language, one of the beauties of the Arabic language is you can take a three-letter verb and you can transform it into many different, uh, if you like, uh, nouns and even adjectives and adverbs, depending on what you add, what you subtract, where you put an alif, where you put. So for example, sami'a, to hear. Samir and sami'a. They both mean the same, but there's a difference in the meaning. Samir, the one who hears everything. Samir, the one who can hear right now. Allah is not Samir, Allah is Samir. This is morphology, the differences. What I'm trying to say, Ar-Rahman, it has an Alif Noon at the end. Rahima is the verb. Ar-Rahman has the Alif Noon. There is no other name of Allah that has this structure of the Alif Noon at the end, other than this name Ar-Rahman. Imam Qurtubi then moves on to say, that this name of Allah Azza wa Jal, Ar-Rahman, can only be used for Allah Azza wa Jal. It cannot be used for any other human being. And this is one of the debates that the scholars have, of which, which of the names are very specific for Allah. Because if you say that a name is specific for Allah, you cannot name a person with it. So for example, whereas you can, you can call someone Malik, Malik, you can name someone, his name is Malik. What does Malik mean? Malik means that he's the owner of something. But you cannot name someone Ar-Rahman. Because that is only Allah Azza wa Jal. Why? Because Allah's mercy, the fact that He can have mercy on anything from the east and the west, from this dunya to the next dunya, from any of His creations, from the heavens right down to the earth, that no one can, no one can be the same as Him in that. So that is very clear. But Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Azza wa Jal, He, if you want to name someone by that name Ar-Rahman, you must put Abd before it. So you say Abdul Rahman. You say uh, the same as Allah. You can't, you can't name anyone Allah. But you can say Abdullah. You can say his name is the servant of Allah. You can say his name is the servant of the Rahman. That is fine. But you can't name anyone Ar-Rahman. So Ar-Rahman, the one who has the strongest and the eternal Rahmah. No other name of Allah has the Alif Noon. And that is why Ar-Rahman is so powerful. That Allah is always characterized by Rahmah. And everything He does is characterized by Rahmah. And that is why Allah Azza wa Jal mentions magnificent things when He mentions Ar-Rahman. So for example, Ar-Rahman u'allama al-Qur'an khalaq al-insan. Because Allah is Ar-Rahman, He created all of mankind. And that is why the term Ar-Rahman, many of our scholars say that the difference between Rahman and Rahim, Rahman is for the entire creation and Rahim is for the believers. This is the primary difference. We'll come to other differences as well. But the primary difference that our scholars mention is that Ar-Rahman is for the entire creation. Ar-Rahman alam al-Quran khalaq al-insan. The entire creation he created. As for Ar-Rahim, then generally speaking, Ar-Rahim applies for those who have believed in Him. وَكَانَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَحِيمًا Allah is Rahim for the believers. His mercy is vast. It encompasses everything. And He states that Himself in Surah Al-A'raf, verse 156, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلْ شَيْءٍ My mercy encompasses everything. So, whatever exists in this world exists within the mercy of Allah. Whether we're talking about the righteous and the unrighteous people and the jinn, whether we're talking about believers or disbelievers, where in the heavens or in the earth, all creatures, all beings that have an understanding and can choose, sentient beings, all of them function within the mercy 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, we did say as we said before, that there is a special element of Allah's mercy which is reserved for the believers on the Day of Judgment. So Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim, he defines the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he sheds difference or light on the difference between our mercy and his. He says, Ar-Rahmatu sifatu taqtadi isal al-manafi'i wal-masalihi ila al-abdi wa in karihataha nafsuhu wa shakkat alayha. The rahma of Allah is a characteristic that entails that Allah provides his servants with bounties, benefits, even if such a person despises them and finds them burdensome. That's the rahmah of Allah. Think about it. But a parent may force his child to revise for an exam. You may impose a temporary limitation on social outings and other matters he may enjoy. Now, obviously, any child will, will hate this. The parent is different to the short-term aspirations of the child. The parent realizes this is an act of care and mercy. And it is. So similarly, when you and I are in the thick of a horrible situation, so dark that it just leaves us lost for words, lost for answers. And we're saying things like, what mercy was there in the loss of my son to a car accident? What mercy was there in the cancer that is now uh, eating me alive? What mercy was there in the unfaithful behavior of my spouse that has just rendered me physically, emotionally, spiritually, paralyzed, unable to move on. Where is there rahmah and mercy of that? At that instant, the definition of Rahman's mercy is to be recalled. Again, the rahmah of Allah is a characteristic which entails that Allah provides his servants with bounties and benefits even if such a person despises them and finds them burdensome. تحياتهم يوم يلقونه سلام that the, that he will greet them uh, or the day that he greets them with salam and Allah mentions the term rahim over here in this context so ar rahim is a special mercy that is given to the chosen and that's the believers ar rahman is the powerful mercy that everybody shares in because Allah is characterized by mercy even the kafir benefits from the rahmah of Allah through ar rahman and that's what our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if Allah did not have mercy then he wouldn't even give the kafir a morsel of water but it is from the mercy of Allah that even the kafir is supplied his daily rizq and his daily sustenance and our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that when Allah created the creation, He divided His mercy into 100 parts. Now this is a symbolic hadith because Allah's mercy is infinite and it cannot be divided. Allah's mercy is infinite. But it, just to give you an understanding, He divided His mercy into 100 parts. One of those parts He revealed to this world. And because of it, the entire creation has some bit of mercy. Because of it, people are merciful to others. Because of it, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, the mother horse, for example, shows mercy to the fowl, to the baby horse. Because of it, the mother bird feeds the baby bird. And Allah has saved 99 parts of His mercy. And those 99 will be used only on the Day of Judgment. So imagine, from the beginning of time until the trumpet is blown. Every act of mercy that any creature, any bird, any animal, any human does to any other creature, any plant, you add all of that mercy for all of the billions of years that creatures have been on this earth. And that comes to one bit of mercy. And 99 times that Allah will use on one day. And that is the Day of Judgment. And that is why our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَوْ عَلِمَ الْكَافِرِ If the Kafir knew how much mercy Allah Azza wa Jal has, even the Kafir will be optimistic about entering Jannah. This is the power of Allah's mercy. And that is why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said that a person may sometimes aspire for some matter of trade or a position of authority, and he pursues it so ardently till he comes so close to attaining it. Then Allah looks at him and he says to the angels, divert it away from him, because if he attains it, I will take him to hell. So it is diverted away from him. But this person continues to see this as a misfortune, saying, Sabaqani fulan, dahani fulan, so and so beat me to it. So and so outwitted me. In reality, it was nothing but the grace of Allah. 
When Allah has characterized Himself with mercy in over 500 verses, when Allah has described Himself in mercy with five different proper nouns, when Allah says He is the Rahman, He is the Rahim, He is the Arhamur Rahimin, the most merciful of all those who have mercy, He is the Khairul Rahimin, the best of all those who have mercy, He is the one who is Dhur Rahma, the one who is always merciful, then how can we ever give up hope of Allah's mercy? How can we possibly give up hope of Allah's mercy? In fact, to give up hope of Allah's mercy is an insult to Allah. To give up hope of Allah's mercy is an insult to Allah of the highest magnitude. And this is not me speaking. This is the hadith. Our Prophet wasallam said, listen to this hadith. Akbarul kabair. The biggest of all kabiras. Sins are kabira and sagira, big and small. You have the big sins, the large sins, the major sins. You have the most major of the major sins, akbarul kabair. What are they? Number one, al ishraq, shirk billah. Number two, al qunutu min rahmatillah. That's the second on the list. And that is why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion, he would say, لا يغفرن الله عز وجل يوم القيامة مغفرة لم تخطر على قلب بشر. He said, Allah will forgive people on the day of judgment in a way which no human heart could ever imagine. In conclusion, one of the greatest signs of success, therefore, is when you are inspired to ask Allah for His Rahmah time and time again, as is stressed in the Quran, in so many passages, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa rabbi ghafir wa raham, وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الرَّاحِمِينَ Say, O Prophet Wasallam, My Lord, forgive and have mercy, for you are the best of those who show mercy. Any person who assumes that he single-handedly is too sinful for Allah to forgive, Wallahi, what an insult. Who are you? Who are you and what are all of your sins compared to the mercy of Allah? Have you limited the mercy of Allah such that you believe you alone in one lifetime can commit so many sins that Allah cannot forgive you? This is the height of insult and that is why it is a type of kufr to assume that Allah cannot forgive me. That's why our Prophet said right after shirk number two to give up hope of Allah's mercy. And the Quran says, Who gives up hope of Allah's mercy other than those who are dalun, completely astray? And Allah mentions in the Quran, Oh my servants who have wronged themselves over and over again, you've gone beyond beyond the bounds. Allah is saying directly in the first person, He's speaking to them. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Never give up hope of Allah's rahmah. Allah forgives all sins. Brothers and sisters, the Rahman, the Rahim, the Arhamur Rahimin can continue to show rahmah and He can do, have more rahmah than all of the creation combined and it will not diminish His rahmah if He shows his, the, the entire creation His eternal rahmah. That rahmah never finishes. So what can I do and what can you do that can extinguish that Rahmah of Allah? This is the hope. This is the month of Rahmah. This is the Shahrul Rahmah. And this is the month where we want Allah's Rahmah. And these are the 10 days of Rahmah. So let us renew our intention that we will gain Allah's Rahmah. Let us have that optimism because that optimism is a part of Iman. Let us believe in Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Let us believe that the Rahman will show us Rahmah, that the Rahim will develop, will envelop us in that Rahmah. Oh, 
All the praise is for Allah, who is the author of all existence and the most generous to his creation, while he is also the all-compelling. He is the only one worthy of our worship, having no partners, no associates, no sons, no daughters, no one whom he must consult, and no one or anything which has any comparison with him. All the praise is for Allah, who is the king of all who claim sovereignty, the only one who has the right to legislate for his creatures. He is the giver of life. He is the causer of death, while death has no effect upon him, because he is the ever-living, the self-subsisting, the eternal and the only absolute. All the praise is for Allah, who has power over all things, and there is in reality no power and no strength, no influence to cause benefit or detriment except through him. It is he who created this complex world, the seen and the unseen, the evident and the speculative, the earth and all that is on it and everything that is in it. It is he who sent his messengers and prophets, alayhim salam, with the common message of strict monotheism, which simply means that there is absolutely no one worthy of worship, no one worthy of our obedience, except the Almighty, the One, the Absolute, and who has no partners. The earlier messages which changed the world in the area in which the prophets were sent, those messages we know have changed and even the prophets who brought them, their names are now lost. We just know in general because Allah told us in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ I've sent to every nation a messenger calling people to worship Allah alone and to avoid the worship of false gods. This essential message has been preserved in Islam in a way that it was never preserved before. Not because the message was different, because it was the same message, but because of the fact that there would be no other prophets who would come after Muhammad wasallam, So therefore that message now had to be protected. It had to be preserved in a way none of the earlier messages were preserved. I'm the latest. What you say, you have come to know 40 years back. And what you call the Big Bang is already mentioned in the book which I read, the glorious Quran. It's mentioned 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, Avalam kafru. Do not the unbelievers see Anna samawati wal arda, that the heaven and the earth were joined together and we closed them asunder. What you're talking about, the Big Bang. I try to imagine compressing a spring. I push it closer and closer and closer together so it's smaller and smaller and smaller and I've stored a tremendous amount of energy in that spring and when I let it go it bursts out it bursts out it bursts out the creation of the universe which you came to know 40 years back is already mentioned in this book the glorious Quran 1400 years ago who could have mentioned that in the Quran so the atheist will say maybe someone wrote maybe it's a fluke maybe it's a guesswork a human being regardless of who they are or where they are, or what they do, will have this curiosity. They'll want to know, why am I here? How did I get here? And do I have a purpose? And if so, what is it? The only one who would really be able to answer that question would be the Creator Himself. 
if there is a creator, it would be up to him to tell us why we were created and what he expects from us and what this life is really about. Allah has shown the people from the time of Adam until right now, has shown the people what he wants from them. And it's a very simple thing. And that is that worship be for him alone without any partners. In fact, we know this life to be a test from Almighty God. That's why we're born and that's why we die. Because there has to be a beginning and an end for us to be tested on. The next life, after this life, no one will ever die again. A bad person or a good person. Both are brought back and they continue to live in the next life, either in good shape or not so good shape, depending on how they did on the test. The worship of the God of Abraham. That was what was taught by these prophets. The Lord of the Arsh and Kursi. We're talking about the Lord of the worlds. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. We're talking about the Lord of the entire universe and beyond. The entire universe and beyond. You know, we live in this dunya and we are fascinated with this dunya which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed has created in a beautiful manner. We're fascinated. There are over billions of people which live on this dunya at this moment in time. Over six billion people that live on the dunya at this moment in time. This dunya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so big that there is space in this dunya for billions and billions and billions or more people. But what is this dunya in comparison to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created out there? This dunya is insignificant. This dunya is meaningless to Allah. It means nothing. It is worthless. So worthless, compare it with the sun. The sun is one star. You know more science than me. You'll be able to tell me better. Take this planet Earth and you place it inside the sun and you will be able to place 1.3 million Earths in the sun. 1.3 million Earths in the sun. Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. The sun is one star, one star. There are stars out there which are millions of times bigger than the sun. You need, you tell me this, that you need millions and millions of stars to make one galaxy. And then you tell me this, that there are zillions of galaxies out there. Let me tell you on top of this, my friend. After this, whatever you see above, whatever you see above, when you raise your head and you look above, whatever you see above, the zillions and zillions and zillions of galaxies, let me tell you, this is everything there is within the first heaven. Everything there is within the first heaven and Allah is the creator of seven heavens. Seven heavens. And the distance between the first heaven and the second heaven is 500 years. You know, the distance that can be covered in 500 years, at what speed? Only Allah knows. Only Allah knows. But it will take 500 years to get from the first heaven to the second heaven. 500 years from the second to the third, third to the fourth, fourth to the fifth, fifth to the sixth, sixth to the seventh. Every time it will take 500 years. After the seven heavens, You all read the Ayatul Kursi. You all know the Ayatul Kursi. After this, you have the Kursi of Allah. You have the chair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know these seven heavens that we've just talked about. In comparison to the Kursi of Allah, they're non-existent. They're meaningless. Rasulullah has given an example in a hadith. Just to give us a little bit of understanding with regards to the seven heavens in comparison to the kursi of Allah. Take a ring from your finger, take it off, the small ring that you have, and place it, let's say, in a desert, the Sahara Desert. It's the biggest desert in the world. 
You know that ring that we take off from our fingers and place it in the Sahara Desert? What, what comparison is in between the ring and the Sahara Desert? Nothing. Nothing. The seven heavens is the ring and the Kursi of Allah is the Sahara Desert. After the Kursi of Allah, you have the Arsh of Allah. You have the Arsh of Allah. Again, Rasulullah has given, has explained, so just so that we can understand. Take the ring, place it in the desert. This time, the ring is the Kursi and the Arsh is the desert. What is the Kursi in comparison to the Arsh of Allah? Nothing. Then you have angels which carry the Arsh of Allah. Their heads are in the seventh heaven and their feet are in the lowest earth. My friends, then you have the Lord of the earth. You should see. لا تدركه الأبصار ويدرك الأبصار هو اللطيف الخبير. He is beyond the size of Allah. Who Allah is? What Allah is? The greatness of Allah is beyond the comprehension of my little mind. This is the being that you and I are messing with. Allah la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum La ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nawm له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤذه حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم Who is Allah? We want to refresh our Iman. We want to be attached to our Creator. We want to fear nobody but Him. We want to please none other than Him. So who is Allah? Come with me to Surah Al-Hadid, chapter 57 of the Quran, where Allah, He says, introducing Himself to us. Lahu mulku samawati wal ard. He is Allah who has the kingdom of the heavens and the earth. Yuhyi wa yumeet, He alone is the one who gives life and death. وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ He is able to do whatever he wishes. يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Everything in the heavens and the earth glorify Allah and He is the most mighty, the most wise. Ya Allah, هَلْ تَعْلَمُ لَهُ سَمِيَّةِ Do you know anybody who shares even one of these characteristics with Allah? Who is Allah? Come with me to chapter 6 of the Quran, Surah Al-An'am. Allah says, وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُ He has the keys to the unseen. No one knows them except Him. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ And He knows everything that is on land and everything that is within the sea. وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا And there isn't a single leaf that falls from any tree except that Allah has knowledge of it. وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ And there isn't even a grain within the darknesses of the land. وَلَا رَطُبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ Nor is there anything moist or anything that is solid. إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ Except that Allah has knowledge of it, it is written within a clear record. لَا إِلَهَا إِلَّا اللَّهِ We bring to your attention, dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the description of just one of Allah Almighty's creation. He is an angel, the chief of the angels, angel Jibra'il alayhi salatu wasalam, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam saw him in his true angelic form. Ahmed narrates in his musnad that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion, he said, رَأَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ جِرِيلَ فِي سُورَتِهِ 
رأى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم جبريل على صورته له ستمائة جناح كل جناح منها قد سد الأفق يسقط من جناحه من التهاويل والدر والياقوت ما الله به عليم He says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Angel Jibreel in his true angelic form. And he had no less than 600 wings. And every one of those wings was huge enough to fill the horizon and cover the skies. One wing spread out, covers every star, covers the sun and the moon, covers every inch of that blue sky that we see. One wing. What then can you make of 600 wings? And if this is the majesty of just one of Allah Almighty's creation, what then can you make of the beauty and the majesty of the Creator Himself? La ilaha illallah. I bring to your attention, dear brothers and sisters, yet a second creation from Allah Almighty. This is the description of one of the angels who are carrying the throne of Allah. Abi Dawood narrates in his Sunan on the authority of Jabir that the Messenger وسلم, said, أذن لي أن أحدث عن ملك من ملائكة الله من حملة العرش ما بين شحمة أذنه وعاتقه مسيرة سبعمائة عام He said عليه الصلاة والسلام Allah has given me permission to give you O Muslims a description of just one of the angels that are carrying the throne of Allah He said the distance between his earlobe and his shoulder is the distance of 700 years worth of travel. If that is the distance between his ear and his shoulder, a hand span of a distance for us human beings, what then about the size of the rest of this angel? What then about the enormity of the rest of his body? If this is the size of one of the angels who are carrying the throne of Allah, what then about the enormity of the throne of Allah itself? And if this is the size of the throne of Allah, what then about the Lord, the Lord and the King of the throne? The name of seeing. Today we've forgotten. Today we've forgotten. Today you and I think what? That to see I need a pair of eyes. You're wrong. Because there are millions around the world that have eyes, but they can't see. It is Allah that allows you to see. Today you think to he, I need a pair of ears. You're wrong. Because there are millions around the world that have ears. They're stuck on their heads. But they can't hear my brother. It is Allah that allows you to hear. Today you think to walk, I need a pair of legs. You're wrong. There are millions around the world that have legs, but they can't walk. It is Allah and Allah alone that allows you to walk. Allah, not you. Allah, not you. Allah doesn't need you, my brother. Allah doesn't need me. Allah doesn't need us. And we have to understand because this is aqeedah. You have to know this so that when you worship, you are always humble. When you worship Him, you never have pride. When you worship Him, you never have arrogance. Because you know, at any given point in time, I am where I am only through His mercy. Only through His rahmah, I am where I am. Not because of your own actions. And to know with depth, with yaqeen, with certainty, that Allah the King of Kings doesn't need anyone. He doesn't need anyone, my brothers. Wallahi, everything you see around you, everything. Today, the Muslims have so much fear in their hearts. Fear, fear of the kuffar, fear of the West, fear of laws, fear of regulations, fear of this and fear of that. But to know that Allah Azza wa Jal is not in need. Wallahi, my brothers, Wallahi, I take an oath by Allah. You have to come to terms. You have to come to believe with certainty that every single human being whoever lived, whoever's living, and whoever is to come and live on this earth, Wallahi, every single human being, every single jinn, every single animal that walks on this earth, every single bird that takes the flight in the sky, every single fish that swims in the oceans of Allah Azza wa Jal, Wallahi, every single land, every single country, Wallahi, with all their governments, and all their military force, and all their might, 
and all their science and all their money and all their know-how all with the exception of none every country every tree every grain of sand every mountain every river every ocean every ocean wallahi every star every sun every moon every single planet every single angel the billions and billions and billions of angels all of them with the exception of none Mikael, Jibrail, Israfil, all the first heaven, the second heaven, the third heaven, the fourth heaven, the fifth heaven, the sixth heaven, the seventh heaven, the ocean above us, the eight that carry the flag of Allah, the hearts of Allah, all are dead, all are dead. Nothing moves, nothing stops, nothing makes, nothing breaks, nothing gives, nothing takes, nothing rises and nothing falls, nothing harms, and nothing benefits in Allah. And until this, yaqeen and faith is in your heart. That nothing, that everything is dead, everything, except Allah. Allah doesn't need anything, anyone. No prophet, no angels, no jinn, no ins. We need him. He's al Hayyul Qayyum. He's the ever living. So you might say, brother, I'm alive. What's so special about that? I'm living. Yeah, but your living is dependent on his existence. He's the first with no beginning. He's the last with no ending. He's Allah. He is Allah. Al-Malik. He's the king. He's the king. He's the one who on the day of judgment, when everything will come to an end, when Allah Azza wa Jal will order the destruction of every living creature, when Allah Azza wa Jal will, Allah will order the destruction, the death of every human, of every animal, of every jinn, of every angel, until there comes a point where there is absolutely nothing in existence except Allah. And Allah will call out, Ain al -buluk? Where are those kings? Where are those kings who thought they were kings? Where are the sons of those kings? Allah will call out. Where are the tyrants? Where are the gangsters? Where are the boys that thought he was something? Where? Aina Abnaum, where are their children? Allah will call. Where are they? And then he will ask, Limanu Mulkulyaum, to who is the kingdom today? Who? Nothing will answer. Allah Himself will answer. Today it's to Allah, the one and only. Allah asks, Alam tara anna Allah yasjudu lahu man fi samawati wa man fi al-ard. Don't you see, O people, that everything in the heavens and the earth prostrates to Allah? Wa shamsu wal qamar, and so does the sun, and so does the moon. والنجوم والجبال so do the stars and so do the mountains والشجر والدواب and so do the trees and so do the moving creatures وكثير من الناس and so do many people وكثير حق عليه العذاب and many people will be punished يا الله punished يا الله
Wüscht ja Allah. 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 Wüscht ja Allah.